Hare Krishna, Varun Prabhu. Thank you very Hare much Krishna. once again for joining today. For Thank the you podcast. for having me. Always, always wonderful to be here in discussion with you about all kinds of things <laughs> yes true. it's amazing in what all directions over the uh, last several months we have discussed a wide variety of topics we discussed about the rasleela and we discovered in, in uh, writing we discussed about scholarship and devotion yes about guru so and uh, today i thought we could discuss about another topic which you have quite deeply specialized in but from one particular perspective mm-hmm. that um, we discussed about um, about prabhupada's bhagavad gita and that is a cardinal that is a book which we use foundationally as the basis of our outreach and even our understanding of krishna consciousness yes so there are uh, there are uh, there are i would say not just people who are you could say envious critics but even people who are objective thinkers they sometimes have some concerns with prabhupada's gita and um, i have my ways of answering them but i thought we could discuss this that uh, appreciating how prabhupada has presented the bhagavad gita not just appreciating in a like a uh, like a hagiographic or a fan sense but actually intellectually appreciating what prabhupada has done in the gita and addressing the common common charge that prabhupada is his government is biased toward bhakti so i have a set of questions maybe i'll start with one by one and i'll briefly offer how i answer and then maybe you can uh, elaborate or amend or however you want to take it forward sounds good so, so the first question is itself the the title itself is a challenge bhagavad gita as it is the yeah. you know, it, it it can seem quite presumptuous to people that how how do you say something like this yeah. so my understanding of this is that prabhupada when he says it's as it is he's talking in terms of its essential conclusions being maintained and prabhupada mentions that in his introduction also that our purpose in writing the gita is the same purpose of the, that was of krishna for descending to the world and that is to raise human consciousness to uh, mm-hmm. share per krishna consciousness so if we consider that there are like in any spiritual path or any spiritual book there are broadly two things there is sadhana and sadhya there is the means and there is the end the path and the purpose different words can be used for that mm-hmm. so if we look at, let the bhagavad gita speak for itself even if we read no commentary at all we just read the sanskrit it's quite clear that the bhagavad gita is a is talking about a personal divinity hmm? so krishna is the sadhya the bhagwan now we could go into further nuances that how that personal divinity is different from ordinary person or even other other traditions conceptions of divinity but the sadhya is krishna even the gita is very clear about that at one level because and arjuna also acknowledges that after krishna speaks the chaturshloki bhagavad gita aham sarvasya prabho voices and arjuna says param brahma param dhama in 10 12 13 so so krishna is the sadhya and bhakti is the sadhan so sarva dharman pratyajamam ekam sharanam braj man mana bhav mad bhakto 1865 66 it's quite categorical and it's not just not just in the end throughout krishna does talk about bhakti and you heard on the masterful job in presenting that bhakti aspect in your commentary also so in terms of the essential conclusions about sadhan and sadhya prabhupad is very very unambiguous and emphatic <laughs> in that sense prabhupad's bhagavad gita is as it is the essential conclusions are very clearly and consistently conveyed so any th- any thoughts on this prabhu oh lots of thoughts okay lots and lots and lots of thoughts you are correct in saying that uh, prabhupad's titling of bhagavad gita as bhagavad gita as it is is uh, a way that he especially emboldens his presentation mm. it separates his gita from all others mm. because it's not even in a subtitle it's in the main title now you and i know that the bhagavad gita is not a title given in the mahabharata context 
And in fact, there are no, no, nor are there any chapter titles given in the Mahabharata mm. for the Gita chapters. So the Bhagavad Gita title and the chapter titles are things that have become conventional over hundreds and hundreds of years. Hmm. So Prabhupada uh, boldly steps up to the plate, not even as a subtitle, but Bhagavad Gita as it is. Wow. Okay. That's sort of a wake-up call. It's, uh, it, it is kind of a, an unexpected, um, uh, you know, who, and, and, and in one sense, it immediately calls into question, who could be saying this? You know, who, who has the audacity, right? Uh, yeah. you, you know, to, to, to stand up and say as it is. Hmm. Well, you know, I believe that Prabhupada wanted to shake things up. After all, the Gita had been translated into English hundreds of times since Charles Wilkins' first translation in 1785. Hmm. And in every case, it's called Bhagavad Gita, and then there's some subtitle. So after a couple of hundred years of translations of, of Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada tags on to the primary title, Bhagavad Gita, as it is. Now, the first thing that this implies very strongly is that there are so many Bhagavad Gitas as it is not. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah, that, that is the first thing it's saying to everybody. Mm. Oh, this is the one that is as it is, and all others are somewhere along the spectrum of as it is not. It is, this is very not as it is. This is somewhat not as it is, and everything in between. Hmm. But the whole thing is as it is not. So then the question uh, stands, then what is Prabhupada insisting that uh, the, 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 that, that, that uh, the Gita stands as it is. What What is that, and why has he been uh, so emboldened uh, to be able to say that? And who is he to say that? Well, let's go to the who is he to say that. There are very few people that have translated the Bhagavad Gita that actually live and breathe the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. So in one sense, Prabhupada is saying, this is the Bhagavad Gita as it is meant to be lived and breathed. That's one interpretation of as it is. What gives Prabhupada the qualification to even say as it is, is that he lived and breathed the Gita. Okay, so that's one as it is. A second as it is, Sorry, so you're in this case, as it is, you're yeah. shifting from the, say, the content of the book to the impact of that content in the life of the person or life of the person who is writing the book. Yes. So, so in that sense, it is as it is. That's right. That's one sense okay. of as it is. That it's, it's, if one can live and breathe the teachings of the Gita, then they have realized the Bhagavad Gita as it is. If you're not living and breathing the Bhagavad Gita in your life, then you're going to be producing a Bhagavad Gita as it is not. Hmm. Okay? Now, so that's, I think that's one very powerful message uh, that Prabhupada is sending through the sort of suffixed title as it is. Another one would be, uh, and uh, to my mind, the Bhagavad Gita, as it is aligned with the great teachings coming from a long and sophisticated lineage of prolific theologians and philosophers. Okay. So, so sorry, it, just one minute. So, would yeah. you like to give all the meanings and then I respond, or how do you want to do this? 
Because if you're in a thought oh, flow, yeah. on a thought flow, you can, I think you can go ahead. I'll no, it's a, however, it's natural. If you feel like jumping in, Chaitanya Charanji, I say jump in. Okay, thank you. So this okay. he lives and reads the Gita. That is a very powerful point because Prabhupada also, when he met George Harrison, he said, you know, how do you know who, who is a devotee of Krishna? Or he says that is who is Prabhupada use the word who is the most addicted to Krishna? That who is talking about Krishna, speak, uh, singing about Krishna, living according to living for Krishna, we could say. Yeah. So that is a very important point. Now, but still, uh, that raises a question that uh, uh, what it what does living and breathing the Gita mean? Say somebody might be, uh, we will come, to, we probably will have to discuss it later. Somebody might say that uh, I am living non violently, and this is what I have, this is what according to me is the in, meaning of the Gita. And in that sense, I am living and breathing the Gita. Somebody else might say, Karma Yoga is what I see as the essence of the Gita. Somebody might even say, Impersonalism is the essence of the Gita. So, yes. so, so in that sense, uh, that claim could be made by others also. But, but yes. I, what we could say is that it certainly narrows the circle to, in one sense, leave out what Prabhupada would call as shushka gyanis, dry logicians or merely academic scholars who, right. for whom Krishna is simply a historical or a mythic entity and the Gita is just a, just a historical or anthropological text to, uh, or yes. abstract philosophical treatise. So we could say that it narrows down, but still it is it's not that Prabhupada alone could make that claim exclusively. So I think that segues to your next point about a tradition also, isn't it? Yes. Yes, precisely. It's, it, it is about application of the teachings. Now, you're right to say that there can be people coming along and saying, well, I'm applying this part of the Gita. But that's another part of what it means as it is. because only part of the Gita is not as it is fully. It is not as it is completely. So Bhagavad Gita as it is in its complete whole form, taken fully, not partially. So as it is means fully, wholly, not partially. Oh, so if somebody is deriving... Uh impersonalistic or karma yoga or non-violence ideas, those could also be uh, those could also be claimed to be based on the Gita, but they are based on a part of the Gita, not the whole of the Gita. That's right. Hmm. And hey, yeah, and Chaitanya Charanji, I mean, we know how annoying it is to be quoted only partially and then have that plucked out of everything else that we've said. It's very annoying. True, true, entirely true. Right? Now, so, but Krishna, you know, he, he's already spoken his teachings to Arjuna. It's very intimate, private setting. No one else could hear him. Uh, Sanjaya was empowered to hear him uh, by the mercy of Vyasa, Vyasa Prasada, Shrutaban, right? So, the, the, but, but, so this was a very personal discussion between Arjuna and Krishna. And yet, its message is universal because Arjuna's trauma represents the trauma of being a conditioned soul. Now, if you leave that out and only go into the parts that talk about the yogi should leave his body on the waxing moon, not on the waning moon, it should be at this time of day, it should be this and so on, um, um, one should have the name, you know, of of of, of, of the divinity on on one's tongue at the time, and so on. And the, so, of course, that's a wonderful teaching, and that's just one of many teachings that Krishna gives in the Gita. But why does he give any of the teachings? See, that's the point. Why does he give any of the teachings? It's out of love for Arjuna. Hmm. True. So if we if we scrape away the narrative from the teachings, then the teachings 
are seen in a distorted way. Just like plucking a statement that you've made out of the context of everything else that you've said. Yeah, makes sense, Bruce. Uh, so just, uh, this is, maybe we'll, it's, how, how should I put it? It's, it's every question that we are answering, it's also going to open further questions. Yes. So now here, in one sense, we are we presuming what is the conclusion of the Gita? When we are saying that somebody should be based on the, their conclusion should be based on, not on the, uh, if they say they are living the Gita, it should not be based on the part of the Gita, it should be in the whole of the Gita. Now, one point, definitely the example was very apt. If somebody talks about dying at a particular point in a particular particular condition of the moon's movements and things like that, or the, or the Uttarayan, Dakshinayan, now that is a very small aspect of the Gita. Very and, small. And, and, and anybody who reads the Gita can agree that this is a, this is really not the teaching of the Gita, uh, or certainly not the central teaching of the Gita. Yeah. And maybe or, the, teaching, or the whole, or the whole teaching of the Gita. Yeah. Yeah. Whole Gita. And maybe we could also say that even nonviolence, nonviolence, however laudable a virtue it is, it is, it doesn't play a central role in the teaching of the Gita. It's again not the whole of the teaching of the Gita. Hmm? So right. we could leave that out. Now, if we talk about karma yoga, uh, I'm just thinking of what all, these are the major explanations. Maybe you can also add to that. What are other claims? So karma yoga could be one explanation. Just yoga or ashtang yoga could be another, dhyana yoga could be another, another claim that it is the essence of the Gita. And of course, jnana yoga or impersonal meditation, those could also be claims. So to some extent, uh, we may... So when we say Bhagavad Gita as it is, we it's it's actually in one sense self-evident that to evaluate where whether it is as it is, we actually ourselves need to know it as it is, or we need to know what it is to put it another way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if now if we look at the Gita. Uh, if we say somebody looks at Sanskrit and they look at the translations. Now, in general, from what I have seen, there are some differences in translations, but it's not that there are, uh, not many people have given radically opposite translations of the same verse. So overall, if, if somebody looks at the Sanskrit or other translations, uh, by that they can get a broad sense of what the work is about. And uh, we can say that uh, Krishna is present throughout the Gita, uh, right from the second chapter as not just a teacher, but as ultimately the object of, object of spiritual focus, object of devotion. And Bhakti is also permeated throughout. And I think in your book, you also mentioned this, that Krishna, is it 12 or 14 times? Krishna talks about, you will come to me, you will attain my abode. So, ma, ma meti, you will come to me, yad gattva nanivartante, you will go there and you will never come back. So right. there is a certain consistency. So we could say there's a sheer repetition of the theme of Krishna's position of the, of the, of the role of bhakti and the attainment of Krishna. And it's not attainment of merging in Krishna, but attainment of as you say, come to him, not unite with him. It's come to him to come to his abode. So we could, if an objective reader reads the Gita, is it fair to say that uh, they can come to a objectively that the Gita does emphasize Bhakti, Bhagawan and attainment of Bhagawan's abode, not merging in Krishna. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah. Um, it, yes, Krishna says that you come to my state of being. You come, you come to the spiritual realm. You're, you will leave the temporal uh, realm of Prakriti. Uh, that in, in in which you know the purusha is is embedded, and you'll be free. You'll be free, and you'll be free to love me. Krishna mm -hmm. says. So, freedom is the bedrock of love. If we don't have freedom, then you cannot love. Mm -hmm. The idea here is that the Gita does tell us. A lot of books don't tell you, but but this conversation 
in this conversation be- between Krishna and Arjuna, Krishna does tell us how he wants to be understood. He says, in the very last words he speaks to Arjuna, he asks two rhetorical questions. The first one is the more important one in this regard. He says, have you heard this whole teaching with thought focused on the single highest point, a kagra? Hmm. Okay, with thought on the single highest point. Then we must ask, what is that highest point? Hmm. Then several verses later, after Krishna's, Arjuna's last words occur, Krishna's last words, first Krishna's last words occur, then Arjuna's, and then Sanjaya characterizes the whole teaching of the Gita, the whole teaching. He calls it Guhyam Param Yogam, the -hmm. supreme secret of yoga. So there's something secret happening here. And that is why so many people read Bhagavad Gita as it is not. Because the book carries a secret message that people just don't get. So, once we understand that there's a single highest point to which all the teachings are tethered, then it changes the way we see those teachings. For example, um, I'm close to Washington, D.C. here in America, and if I'm to travel to New York, which is about a five-hour drive, and I look at the scenery on the way, that's one way of viewing the scenery. I've never been to New York, but I'm seeing the scenery on the way. Once I've been to New York and I have to come back to New York another time, I will see the scenery in a very different way because I'll see how it leads up to New York. The first time I go to New York, I don't see how it leads up to New York. But when I see it with an advanced knowledge of New York, I see the different stages of the journey differently. Similarly, when we, when we know the, the single highest point, then we'll look at chapter eight differently about the waning and the waxing of the moon. Mm. We'll look at that differently. Um, uh, we'll look at um, uh, Palatyaga differently in chapters three, four, and five. We'll look at at the renunciation of the fruits of actions. Yes, of course that's important. Yes, chapter eight's important. All these teachings are important, but you don't have the perspective of what really is being said and why it's being said until you've been to the peak. Prabhupada was came from the peak to us and said Bhagavad Gita as it is. Okay. It's beautiful. I love this metaphor. Uh, it's actually, even if we consider something like a, say, a mystery novel, uh, which has a plot, you know, yes. It's like if we read a book, we can read a book as a reader and we can read a book as a writer. When we read a book as a reader, it's just enjoyable. But when we read a book as a writer, then we come to the conclusion, then we start seeing, okay, how the author has constructed the various parts. Okay, yes. what's the point of this plot, or plot twist? What is the point of this, this character uh, elaboration? What is the point of this narrative? And in one sense, till we come to the end, uh, especially if it's something like a like a mystery novel or fiction. Sometimes if it's a non-fiction book, the author may tell right in the beginning, this is how I'm constructing my argument. This part of the book is about this, this part of the book is about this, this part of the book is about this. Hmm? But if it's a, more of a, and the mystery novel metaphor might work because this is, as you said, go here. 
So this is yes. Paramaguhya. So in that sense, it's we can look at all the parts and we will understand those parts to some extent. But when we see the whole, then all the parts fit into a fit into a coherence, which uh, which often is uh, from what I also read some Bhagavad Gita before I was introduced to Krishna consciousness, and after also I've read some. So what I found is that it's very difficult to show the coherence of the Gita for most commentators. Yes. We, so that is, so now Prabhupada has come from the top, and he so Prabhupada is at the end, in one sense. It's we could almost say it's like a like some mystery novels. They become so famous uh, that. Maybe there are authors who write about those authors or about that particular book. Mm -hmm. How is this book constructed? So Prabhupada is doing like that. So mm. in one sense, for Prabhupada, he is he, he is giving us the conclusion of the mystery or the re revelation, and then he is telling us, okay, how is how is this mystery constructed? How is to some extent? Yes. So, so again, I. I uh, it, so again, it leads to a further assumption, and maybe we will have to discuss this point that that we are assuming that Prabhupada is coming from the top, is knows the conclusion is coming toward that. So maybe for any kind of study, there is some amount of uh, uh, in terms of concept, some axioms have to be accepted, and in terms of uh, teachers, some kind of authority in the teacher has to be accepted. Yes. Without that, we just will not be able to move ahead at all. So, uh, so what are your thoughts on this? So are these like these two axioms that the Bhagavad Gita is a coherent body with which expresses God's love for us and that Prabhupada is himself relishing that, that love of Krishna's love and wants to share that with us through the Gita. Would these be like the foundation you know, axioms and authority that we may need to accept to understand the Gita? Yes, well, okay. Um, the authoritative, you know, uh, uh, shall we say, um, position of the uh, commentator uh, is one thing, but the, the, you know, what the text is saying, uh, the original verses of the Gita are saying, as you said, it's fairly plain to see what's going on. I mean, some translations can be rather weak. And frankly, if they're not informed of that single highest point, then they can translate, or, or some of them are not translators, even though they say they're translating it from the Sanskrit. They don't even know Sanskrit. <laughs> Many of the published Gita, they don't even know Sanskrit. And they say a new translation. How does that make any sense? Mm. It's it's cheating, actually. It's cheating. Don't say that I have a new translation when you don't know Sanskrit, because then what are you translating from? You're translating only from your own subconscious mind, which could say anything. Very subjective. The whole idea is to understand the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Mm. Now, that must mean... Now, here's where your mystery novel uh, metaphor doesn't quite work, okay? It's only a mystery to readers who are not guided uh, by the proper teacher, one. And two, even when guided by the proper teacher, we have to be purified enough to be able to receive that message in our hearts. So that's why we read Bhagavad Gita as it is for decades. Because the more we read it, the more it sinks in, and the more we realize the supreme secret of yoga. So this is, so it's, it's, um, it's secret only because we're not ready to hear it. It doesn't want to stay secret, but it remains secret because 
It's the most profound message of the Gita. What Prabhupada is doing when he presents the, the, the verses of the Gita, and sometimes, as you uh, spoke earlier, sometimes people will object. You know, there'll be a yoga in the word for word, and then Prabhupada will put devotional service in the translation. Wait a minute. How do you go from yoga to devotional service? Hmm. The, the reason he can do that is because he was at the ultimate peak of yoga, ekagra. The problem is that yoga is very complex. There are many yogas as a means, and there are many yogas as an end state. Prabhupada was concerned about the absolute process and the absolute end, which is there in the Gita. But if you don't know that, if you're not realized in that, then you're going to object to things like that. Because, um, But what's really happening there is Prabhupada wants to fast track his reader to that ultimate mountain point. It, it's sort of like, instead of having to climb up so strenuously, let me, let me take you on a lift and get you right. Like there are these lifts that go up to the mountaintops, right? You just slide, glide along, right? I don't know, on these ski, these ski places that... Uh, have those lifts, right? Yeah. And once we get to the top of the mountain with Prabhupada, with a teacher like Prabhupada, then we can ski down, teach other people how to ski. We can tell people what we saw at the top of the mountain. And we can tell others how Prabhupada showed us the top of the mountain. Skiing as it is. You know, Bhagavad Gita as it is. Okay. So, 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 so we, that's why you need a teacher, even in skiing. Uh, now, I honestly, Chaitanya Charanji, I will confess, I know nothing about skiing. Okay. Let's just get that right out here. Okay. <laughs> but I have to insist that skiing is a very skillful sport. And that it requires a teacher. Mm. True. So the authority of the teacher, you brought that up. One of the ways we know the authority of the teacher is that he or she practices what he or she preaches. True. There has to be an embodiment a veritable embodiment of the very teachings that are dispensed. And that's when the student becomes inspired. This is when the student will be moved to want to go to the top of the mountain. Now, people who read other Gitas, I've not noticed that they get terribly moved to reach the top of the mountain because half the time, they can't figure out what the Gita is saying. Hmm. And that's the reason for Prabhupada's commentary. And I'll just stop after saying this, that Prabhupada's Gita is either being read by the devotee in us, by the bhakta in us, but if we're really not bhaktas yet then Bhagavad Gita, as it is, is not for you. My God, that's a strong statement. I think we'll come to <laughs> yes, that. Yes, it is a little strong. <laughs> yeah. And, and, the way you, and the way you can tell when it's not for someone is that they don't like it. That's interesting. So you could almost put it this way that, uh, Prabhupada sometimes gives the example that uh, if you are going to open a, if you open a gold shop, you're not going to have uh, millions of people coming to the gold shop because how many people can buy the gold? There you go. So similarly, when Prabhupada is giving Bhagavad Gita as it is, he is giving the bhakti message and that is a message of gold. So while Prabhu, in one sense, we distribute the Bhagavad Gita as it is very widely, 
because we don't know where those souls with those devotional inclinations are they could be That's scattered right. in various parts of the world and for those who have those uh those devotional inclinations from their upbringing from their previous lives or oh, it's like the bhagavad gita has such a uh, bhagavad gita as it ignite. has such a magnetizing power it just pulls right. them it could ignite that ignite you know yeah. something that's been lying dormant yes it it may not be a um a, a book that immediately you know is efficacious but sitting on the shelf you know with the bold printing on the side bhagavad gita as it is as it was printed back in the day in 1972 very bold very thick binding one day you just don't know you can't predict the way the presence of such a book in one's home can take effect hmm there's no predicting that and in one sense prabhupada also gave that metaphor when he said that it's like sowing a seed you don't That's know right. exactly we are sowing the seed but we ourselves in one sense don't know uh, how long the seed will take to uh, grow so yeah so so in one sense if we say prabhupada bhagavad gita is as it is and krishna himself says that those who even want to know him as he is are manushya naam sahasreshu Uh, one in thousands endeavor for perfection at seven point three, and That's then right. among them, one in one among those thousands actually come to know him. Right. So, so then that means what we, uh, it, to some extent, it becomes our responsibility to explain Prabhupada's Gita. Yes, and Prabhupada, and then uh, so you have done that with your Bhagavad Gita uh, book, which is a uh, classic. and uh, you know we all devotees give bhagavata classes i write my gita daily we are all trying to so prabhupada has given us that shown the devotional essence of the gita now yes. it is for us to make in one sense the gita show the people the gita's relevance and also show the gita's essence why does it matter yes. to you and what what is it actually saying so how prabhupada's bhagavata is as it is that that may that may be our responsibility to show to explain i think prabhupad also said my devotee disciples and followers will write books on my books purport yes. to my purport sort of that's right yes but we don't do that enough yes so i agree we, we do it we do it orally but we don't do it in written form enough in terms of a deliberate commentary hmm. that illuminates prabhupad's commentary you know i hear a lot of classes where um devotees will give class and and they're obviously not familiar with exegesis and with um the way to comment on uh prabhupad's words and the words of the gita there's and and, and you don't have to be a master of sanskrit in order to do that there're ways to illuminate you know um uh, embellish and expand beautifully what is there and not go off and tell stories about you know whatever you know someone you met the other day or someone you ran into out on sankirtan or whatever <laughs> you know, yeah that's true <laughs> you know again there's and and while some of those things could be relevant i mean you know i'm i'm not going to uh discount that 100% but but to delve into the the each and every word of the text to to know how to perform an exegesis exegesis means generating out from literally in the latin exegesis to generate out from the text itself further layers of meaning and angles of approaching Mm. it's so important that's true you know, so if we are not uh, as i said not everybody has to be necessarily academically trained but at least broadly we need to understand the issues that are that are going on i remember one of my early days 
one of one of, uh, another friend of mine who had uh, but also been interested in bhakti he had grown up like me in a indian brahminical family he knew little more sanskrit at that time than what i did so he asked one question and uh, the same point which you mentioned that sometimes prabhu pat translates yoga or as karma yoga as devotional service <laughs> yeah so so he said and how does this how how, how 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 can this be translated like this and uh, the preacher who had answered do you think you know sanskrit better than prabhu pat now i felt that you know that's rather than it's almost rather than answering the question it's attacking the questioner and we could say that the devotee maybe felt that it is attack on prabhu pad and attack on their own faith so yeah. would you consider that as a unhealthy way of doing exegesis yeah you know um devotees can be very nervous around those devotees who have the academic uh training and background um okay you know and 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 i mean even when i was flown out to la in 2017 to be the keynote speaker at the prabhupad festivals that they've been holding there for several decades i was the keynote speaker and the gbc for that zone called me up a week or two before and said you know um there are some devotees i have heard from that are concerned that you correct prabhupad's sanskrit in class sometimes i said i never correct prabhupad ever i may offer alternative understandings of a word but i don't correct my spiritual master i did and i challenged him you show me one recording in which i correct prabhupad sanskrit and i will perform prayas chit them the rest of my life you know <laughs> so you know I, i don't do that you see what he was really expressing was a nervousness mm. uh with erudition Now, some people will say Garuda is a mundane academic. Well, that's like saying to a devotee who happens to know how to use power tools when they build a temple, "Oh, he's just a carpenter." Hmm. That's not fair. No, he's a devotee using power tools, a power saw. Now, academics. provides power tools i mean the devotee building the temple could have used a manual saw right have you seen those hmm. uh, 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 right hmm. but how much more efficient and advanced is having an electrical you know saw so um i forgot what they call it circular uh, a, whatever saw but anyway it's electric and it saw something maybe about 20 times faster than a, than a hand saw hmm. so now the problem with academic devotees if there's a problem is the same problem that you can have with any other devotees who gain the tools but become so identified with the tools that they forget what the tools were meant for beautiful but the tools themselves don't we don't condemn suddenly when it comes to academics it's too easy to to condemn them prabhupad prabhupad says all kinds of things about scholars what do they know the honey on the outside of the jar um you know um uh you cannot uh, you know being a scholar of the tradition is not a qualification and so on but if one is a bhakta and has those tools we are silly not to use them and take advantage of them mm-hmm. true 
So, so we, we should not be afraid of the electric saw. Now, if you don't know how to work an electric saw, stay away from it because it's dangerous. Academic tools can also be dangerous if you do not know how to work them properly. So the same thing, you see? The, the, it, it, we all have tools from different areas. Suddenly when it comes to, say, a Harvard PhD, oh, the guru is just a mundane scholar. Oh, is that okay? <laughs> that's, that's fine. Okay. You can toss me out that easily. That's fine. But what is going on is there's a fear of those power tools. But every field has power tools. Every field does. Uh, it's, no. it's, you know, uh, oh, I think what, you're, what you are talking about is not restricted only to academics. There's certainly academic scholars may experience it more than others. But even when new people come and they have a lot of questions. Yes. They ask, and not just questions, but a lot of difficult questions. Then the tendency is that well, this person will never become a devotee. It's too many questions. Mm. So they, they get neglected. They get neglected, they get rejected. So in so many ways, I was fortunate. I was introduced to Krishna consciousness and to, uh, to teachers, devotees who introduced me. They were, they were very patient answering my many, many questions. Oh, I can't imagine all the questions you would have been asking, <laughs> Chaitanya Chanji. Yeah. A boatload of questions, I am quite sure. And of course, and, and of course, you keep asking questions. But in the in the devotional context, you yeah, know, that's true. In the teaching context, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I think uh, so that fear is uh, is as you said because maybe the, there's a certain sense of insecurity of one's own faith, and it, it, I'm not saying that in the sense of criticizing, but it's just that one feels unequipped to deal with the questions. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think you're right. So mm -hmm. you could say that if somebody is asked. No, how, what, what, uh, how could Prabhupada say, call his Gita as Bhagavad Gita as it is? Or how is Prabhupada translating like this? So I remember once I was involved in some, I made some statements which some devotees found uh, questionable or disrespectful. So you had gone through the transcript and you said that, you also said the same thing. You know, you're dealing with important issues and you had valid points, but you didn't have the training to deal with those issues maturely enough expertly enough. Right. So I think that if some devotees find that, similarly, I could say that uh, if some devotees find that somebody is asking difficult questions about the Bhagavad Gita or Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, rather than attacking the person, maybe it's best that they connect that person with somebody else, somebody who is more expert, more trained, who can answer those questions maturely, not make it an attack on that person, not doubt the person's, person's sincerity, or integrity or whatever. Would that be a healthy approach? Yes. I, I, I think that um, uh, you, you raise an important issue the, of, about really carefully hearing devotees. Now, uh, the, you implied earlier that sometimes when someone has so many questions, that could be unnerving. You know, that can be a sort of, um, yeah. well, and, and you know what? That's okay. We're not, we don't have to know everything. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, I gave a whole talk on the Upanishads. I, there was a yoga group who wanted to start reading the Upanishads, but they didn't know much about them. And I said, you know, ask me anything. Now, when I say ask me anything, that doesn't mean I'm going to be able to answer everything hmm. i could say i'll answer all your questions i don't say that i say ask me anything and then we'll see what happens <laughs> so in other words that's the <laughs> disclaimer you, know, you can ask me anything i don't know if i can answer everything okay but yeah. you can ask me anything and then we'll see what we've got you see hmm. it's okay to say you know i haven't thought deeply into this enough I will look into it for you. Or there's a place where you can look or read that should be able to respond to that question. So it's okay, you know, not to know everything. 
<laughs> I mean, you, we can't know everything. Everything is too big. True. So I think that, you know, um, when we approach the Bhagavad Gita through Prabhupada's eyes, it's a privilege because for the first time, the Bhagavad Gita is being presented in a way to be intensely devotionally mm. absorbed in Krishna Seva. I don't know of any other Gita that really fosters that kind of presentation. Mm. Beautiful. That's true. Now, I'll just going back uh, to your earlier metaphor. You said that you go to the top of the mountain. Yes. And then somebody who has been at the top of the mountain will come down from there. Yes. So they they will tell us about the path also differently. Okay, what is here in this path? What is in the path? So you could say that, yes, there are places where, where the Sanskrit is karma yoga. And Prabhupada is translating as uh, devotion. Or just yoga also Prabhupada translates as devotional service. So it's almost like we could say that you look at it you look if, if it's a road and it's a landmark and some kind of landmark, it might appear to be, if I look at it from here, it appears to be like a, it's like an ordinary stone. I look at it in isolation, it looks like a stone. But from the top, I look at it, hey, there's some pattern on it. It looks different. Maybe it's a part yes. of a whole structure. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so so That's right. when Prabh- Prabhupada is translating Karma Yoga as Bhakti Yoga, he is, you can say, giving us the top of the mountain view of what it is. And if you look at it from that perspective, Krishna does talk at several places how karma yoga culminates in bhakti yoga. You know, Yajna Atat right. Karma Nantra 3.9, 3.30. So what is that? 3.30 is Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyasya Adhyatma Chitasa. That's right. Yeah. Of course, 18 chapter. So Karmanatam Abhyarcha, worship me with your work. So, right. So in that sense, Prabhupada is, that I love the metaphor, Prabhupada is giving us from the, the top view. And also we could say, the Prabhupada is not denying, uh, denying or cancelling what Krishna is doing. Because Prabhupada is giving us the Sanskrit, Prabhupada is giving us the word to a translation, uh, is a transliteration. And then, so if Prabhupada was just simply, we could say, uh, whitewashing the Gita or, or bhakti washing the Gita, if there's a word like that, just rendering everything into bhakti, if that was his intention, he could have avoided giving the Sanskrit. That's right. So that means Prabhupada is giving us how the stone, if you consider one particular word or one particular uh, verse from the Gita to be like one brick on that path. Yeah. Prabhupada is letting us see how the brick seems in that particular context. And then he's also telling us how the brick is seen from the top view. Right. So in that Beautiful. sense, Prabhupada is not really cancelling or overwriting. Krishna's no, words it, it can appear to be, it can, what appears to be a deviation is in fact a a genuine deepening. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, okay. is so it, it 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 looks like, now. Why would why would any author want to put in his own book something that would de-authenticate what he's saying? <laughs> Beautifully <laughs> put. Okay. <laughs> why, I mean, why would any author do that? No, what Prabhupada is showing is that this is where this is going. There is a a facet of bhakti, which involves acting from the heart. And that's the Mm -hmm. ultimate action. Now, if you want to just leave it acting, you know, in the world as something that gradually builds up to some level of yoga, well, that's, you know, I mean, okay. It's not perfection. Or maybe it's not the perfection of perfection. Maybe it's a perfection, but it's not the perfection. Prabhupada was giving us the perfection. So he was uncompromising. He sees karma yoga, he says, devotional service. Because we human beings are feeling, thinking, and acting creatures as human beings. Hmm. So each of these yogas is absolutely essential. But karma is produced. We act out of our thinking. And our thinking 
is coming out of our feeling. We originate everything we do starts with the heart. Why? Because the self is situated in the heart. Divinity's presence is within the heart. So that's where we all start, whether we know it or not. So from the heart, the, the affective faculty, to the cognitive faculty, and then finally, the interactive faculty. By affective, you means action or A? Is it A or Affective. A? Affect. Affective. Okay. Right. Feeling. The, 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 the okay. Uh, sentient. Okay. The sentient. Uh, okay. The sense of, uh, of, of feeling. The sentience. Okay. Um, so, so you're translating uh, thinking, feeling, willing into adjectives, is it? Um, uh, approximately? Affective, yeah. cognitive, and... Yeah, uh, 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 interactive, interactive. Interactive, okay. That's more right. of intention or interaction with people, basically. That's right. Or interaction with the world, interaction. You know, when you act in this world, you're, you're interacting, whether you know it or not. Okay. You can be in a desert and you're acting, you're interacting with the outer world. But it all starts from the heart. Ooh. It's the heart start. Okay, that's so, that's that's where. Yeah, that's true. So, just I'm trying to understand. It. First, you said that why would author put in their book something that would be authenticate, and then yeah. you came to it starts from the heart. So, what was the exact connection between these two points? Okay, so, so, Prabhupada. If we read carefully into Prabhupada's words. Hmm. And even his other teachings, you know, the other teachings we know in the CC, we, we, we know that, uh, you know, karma, jnana is not necessary to pursue. Bhakti is the only thing necessary to pursue. Why? Because it includes jnana and karma. Anavritam. It's there and it's un uncovered or pure form, you could say. That's right. Hmm. So, in other words, you know, you know, I mean, karma may uh, well human beings cannot act without drawing from the heart the question is whether the heart is purified and and once it's purified it automatically um, engages the cognitive and interactive faculties because everything ultimately it, um, is grounded in the heart uh, comes from the heart um, expands from the heart and is uh, and one is ultimately liberated in a totally free and pure heart so bhakti contains everything and then of course there's the precondition to bhakti and karma and jnana in the first place there's no reason to be a human being unless there is divinity of which we are tiny little infinitesimal sparks so so it's all in relation to the divine. Mm -hmm. Bhakta means uh, a participant, literally, um, a, a kind of participation. Uh, yes. You know, um, a, 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 a division, a, a, um, a, a, a participating portion, you know, Beautiful. of the divine. And the more we become purified, the more we perceive that, the more we live that, the more we breathe that. And then Prabhupada's Gita just makes a whole lot more sense. But that's what Amazing. Prabhupada's Gita is promoting. It's promoting yeah, go ahead. acting from the heart. Okay. So this is beautiful. So what if I understand that what you are doing is that without getting too much into the technicality of the flow of the Gita, you are talking about how Prabhupada's, uh, Prabhupada's uh, explanation of the Gita, in one sense, uh, uh, resonates with or echoes universal human experience. Yes, so, so, exactly. Yeah, exactly. We all act from the heart. Yes, and if we are parts of God, that means God also acts from the heart. So, from so his divine heart to us. Sorry, the divine. Yeah, from his divine heart to our hearts. And, yes. I mean, look, in the Gita, Krishna is not playing his flute. Yeah, okay. But he's still sending out a love call to Arjuna. Hmm. It's no different. 
Yeah, that's why I think you called it the beloved Lord's uh, secret, secret love, love song. song. Secret love song. Yeah. yeah. So it is a secret love song. Look, how does the Gita begin? You know, it's so typical for uh, the reader of the Gita that's already familiar with the Gita to skip the first chapter after they read it once. Ah, okay, I know Arjun is freaking out. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Freaking out. They don't understand hmm. that the first chapter. is extraordinarily profound the first chapter begins with a conflict in the outer world in arjuna's outer world that conflict in the outer world becomes now an inner world conflict for Ar- for arjuna he then tries to deliberate on what to do with this e- irresolvable ethical dilemma and he starts emptying the contents of his mind to krishna his confidant and then it becomes something so futile and so impossible it becomes an irresolvable conflict and it describes how arjuna's heart is now a shattered heart so his innermost realm of the heart is shattered and therefore he collapses We don't collapse when there's an intellectual issue. Do you ever we don't collapse when there's an intellectual issue. But when our hearts are shattered, our knees buckle and we fall over. Amazing. So so again and that's is, yeah. and that's where the Gita starts Chaitanya Charanji as you well know. Mm beautiful so So what you're saying is that what is a uni- if we overlook the first chapter of the Gita, the fact that the Gita is actually uh, addressing a collapse of a collapse that originates in the heart, that it is it is the divine heart speaking to the human heart, but a shattered human heart. That's without that setting, we will get caught at the level of the head in analyzing the Gita. But right. the first chapter serves to show how it is not the head is not involved. but it is it runs much deeper the gita the concerns of the gita they are they are profound we could say ex- existential concerns and uh, of the heart and from there the gita starts and then it's beautiful so we could say from arjuna's shattered heart that is revealed in the toward the end of the first chapter and the start of the second chapter then we move forward and by the end it's almost like krishna is bearing his heart and revealing That's his right. love that's right so and that i think that revelation of krishna's love is what ultimately heals arjuna's heart that's why he gets up at the end exactly and every teaching every teaching krishna gives whether it be palatyaga whether it be ashtanga yoga whether it be a uh, uh, yajna whether it be whatever whatever the teaching hmm. it is laced fully but suddenly with krishna's love beautiful you know as a parent when you raise a child you know you can if if they're if they're taking geometry you know the kid needs a compass and a pencil and calculators maybe or whatever i don't know now if that if that equipment is given with love it's more important than the equipment itself mm. now if a perfect stranger gives it to them then it doesn't carry meaning the same way that's so- probably gives the example of the mother that finds the shoe of the child who is absent mm. and love wells up in her heart now frankly you know chetan and charanji if you ever see me looking at my shoe and somehow love welling up in my heart i mean you should be concerned about me okay now but this is the child's shoe who is absent and so the shoe takes on more value than just the cloth it's it's made up it's about the heart we are a tradition of the heart 
It's so easy to deviate from that by getting caught up in all the philosophical little details. Mm. You know, that's what you said that earlier. What can seem as deviating is actually deepening. That's right. So that uh, it's not deviating. It's trans- okay, so you're translating karma yoga. So Prabhupada is like that. Uh, we could say like that mother, and for him, everything in the Gita is the word spoken by Krishna. And yes. they are expressing Krishna's love. So Prabhupada yes. is revealing that to us. And yes. in one sense, we can also say that Krishna also does that throughout. It's uh, almost absolutely like everywhere he's sprinkling in drops of bhakti. Absolutely. And well, oh, but th- but there's a precondition to bhakti, and that is Krishna's love for us. Bhagavat Prema. Bhagavat mm-hmm. Prema. That love is what ignites the hearts of souls who then learn and think about things, that's the jnana yoga, and then who act accordingly. That's the karma yoga. But it's all in bhakti yoga. Beautiful. So, so there are various parts. So one way of looking at it is that they culminate in bhakti yoga, but another way is also, you can say they are also included in bhakti yoga. Yes. Both ways. So, if you took it, take it from one perspective, that when Krishna is teaching it, his purpose of teaching it is an expression of the love of his heart. So, then in that sense, if there's a, at least there's the beginning of the divine recipro- reciprocation of the divine, we may not have reciprocated. But still, from Krishna's perspective, it is coming out of his love. And yes. even if somebody is reciprocating at the level of karma yoga, at one level, it is a part of the circle of bhakti. It may, the circle yes. may not have been completed till now, but still, it's like Krishna is here, we are here, and his message has come to us. If we are not comprehended it, then the circle is not yet completed. So yes. for, from our perspective, this, it may not even be clear that it is coming from Krishna's heart. So you might, some, you might say, it's okay, it's coming, who is Krishna? Maybe Krishna is some, uh, Krishna is whatever conception of Krishna somebody might have. So for, from our perspective, the circle is not completed yet. Or we right. don't even know where it is starting and we don't know where exactly it is meant to be going. But still, yes. we are already in that circle because yes. we are studying the Gita and appreci- and trying to live it at some level. Yes. So Beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. So, so even the title of, of this bu- book, I mean, we get back to the title, Bhagavad Gita as it is. So mm-hmm. what is as it is referring to? Bhagavan and Gita. Gita, his song, be issuing forth from his divine heart to us. This is not just a, an academic teaching to Arjun in the middle of a battlefield. This is not a technical, you know, um, a treatise on uh, some sort of philosophy. Hmm. All of these teachings are perfectly carrying. That Gita, that song issuing from the heart of the divine to us. Now, when Prabhupada sees everyone reading Bhagavad Gita in the West, so many translations, dozens and dozens of translations, and they're not hearing the song, Prabhupada comes along and says, you don't hear the song, so I'm going to amplify it. You don't have the ears to hear it. The song is there but you're not hearing it. So I will set up a little amplifier called Bashya. Okay. And this way you can hear the song. Maybe, maybe if you're not ready to hear the song, then you'll just put it down. Mm, and in one say his, says his title as it is, is itself the beginning of the amplification amplification. Yes. So that itself is uh... Uh, you know the word you had used the word audacious earlier. Yes, the, the word audacious has, as initially it was somewhat that uh, meaning was impudent, but now it is also being used in the sense of courageous. Yes, that was the audacious. So it has a positive connotation also. That's so, right. So, uh, so an uninformed reader might find Prabhupada's uh, titling audacious in the negative sense, but That's we right. can say that Prabhupada's titling is audacious in the positive sense. It's not presumptuous, yes. but it's like courageous. It's heroic. He's issuing a, yeah. 
issuing a you could say almost a bold statement of purpose over there very very bold very bold think of a bolder way to do it okay. it's a wake up call hmm True. you know it's probably setting an alarm you know when someone wants to get up you know early at a certain time you set the alarm so we didn't set the alarm probably has set the alarm for us he's come into our lives through a book he set the alarm wake up here's what you need to wake up to hmm. but if you need to go back to sleep so be it okay so that means we do, you don't really it i love this wake up metaphor because it's you see even in our sleep we are we are thinking something we are dreaming something we are feeling something that's But right when we wake up it's a drastically different experience that's right so so you could say prabhupad's title as it is and some of the places where prabhupad seems to bring bhakti where it is not there literally speaking so those are all meant to jolt us or wake us out of our intellectual preconceptions yes our preconceptions and and what is going on here so if we wake up then we will if we really wake up then we will try to explore and then we'll appreciate what prabhupad is doing yes and if we don't then we will just say, okay this doesn't make sense to me this is just this is bias this is uh, this is whatever there some negative right they will dismiss it as with some negative perspectives right i mean it could be an in between state like on an alarm you can press the snooze button right <laughs> you can get you know, let me snooze a little longer you know let me avoid really addressing these important life issues a little longer i'll come back to it you know there are those people too yeah that's true that's uh, you know so they wake up a little bit then they press the snooze button you know let me snooze a little longer again but we have to also make sure that we bhaktas we devotees don't press a snooze button even as bhaktas <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah, right that's true yeah so that's why these discussions these dialogues are also continuing the wake up call that's the whole point of sangha yeah it true i was thinking when you were to say this be bhaktas i thought you would say something else that sometimes you know prabhupad's books of issue the wake up call but sometimes the way we respond to the people instead of waking them up further we put them to sleep you know this makes <laughs> <Yeah>. no sense <laughs> that's right <laughs> so if we don't present prabhupad's uh, message properly then then we put people back to sleep yeah yeah exactly. we also be doing a disservice you yeah. know sometimes devotees they often talk about uh, and i am also guilty of this that devotees talk about how many people i have brought to krishna consciousness at one level we never bring anyone it's krishna uses us and krishna actually brings but even if we keep track of that it's uh, you know we hardly ever keep track of how many people didn't come to krishna consciousness because of me the right. way i acted the way i presented things so we might so in the name of being faithful to prabhupad if we end up being uh, not reasonable in explaining what prabhupad is doing then we may actually do disservice to prabhupad in a sense yeah that's right this is a very important point actually chaitanya charanji and i appreciate it um we do need to be careful on how we present krishna bhakti it is a very very grave responsibility because we need to be careful that we don't import issues that we're dealing with personally and unconsciously try to take it through imposing aspects of krishna bhakti on others inside or outside of the movement um i i've seen devotees you know do a lot of this importing and i've seen myself do it and i 
put a check on it. It's very important to put a check on those things. Mm. Um, I love the way you phrase this. We, we are ourselves dealing with some issues in our lives. So we import them into first our present our presentation of Krishna Bhakti, even when that is not relevant. And not only do we import it over there, but we also impose it. That it's it's two different steps. So right. some things which are not relevant to the audience, we don't even have to present it at that point. So we present it and we present it so forcefully that the audience is not going away from Bhagavad Gita. Actually, they are going away from what we are speaking, the way we are presenting the Gita or what we are speaking, which may not even be the core part of the Gita. Advances. Yeah. yeah. So, this is very, very important. I was Actually, this may lead to the next point I was going to make. Yes. So, in one sense, when Prabhupada is saying Bhagavad Gita as it is, is it an exclusivist claim? Because you started by saying when you say as it is, then it also means that other Gitas are not as it is. If so right. that, that impression can come up. But it seems that uh, Prabhupada respected Ramacharya's Gita. Prabhupada, respected, Prabhupada said, I think there's a past time where somebody said, Swamiji, your Gita is like Ramacharya's Gita. And that person was seeming to say it in a critical way. And Prabhupada said, that's a compliment. So, of course, Prabhupada had his own distinct presentation that he gave. But so, because this as it is claim may be mistaken to be exclusivist by some uh, readers, or sometimes it may be mistaken to be exclusivist even by devotees, and that's how they may present it to others. So, <laughs> yeah. how do we understand the as it is claim in a way that is faithful but not exclusivist? Yes. Well, you know, I mean, the fact is, it is excluding most other Gitas. Um, it's, it, it does have that strong implication that most other Gitas are Bhagavad Gita as it is not. Um, you, they would, you know, the, Prabhupada might very well label it not at the end of as it yeah, is not. Lecture, sorry, I heard a lecture with. I heard, I've not read this. Prabhupada said, this is not Bhagavad Gita as it is. This is Bhagavad Gita as you are. So, <laughs> well, okay. See, so many people could just project into the Gita hmm. and, and so on. So, so the thing is, that while it is exclusive in the sense that it's excluding these other interpretations, it's also inclusive in the sense that, in fact, it's the most inclusive because it brings out the universal message of the Gita, if you can hear it. Krishna's love song mm. is not exclusive. It is secret when we're not ready to hear it. But when we're ready to hear it, it's no longer secret. Okay. But so, it is secret. I mean, we, why are some things secret? Okay, Prabhu, just um, we, sorry, sorry, if you don't yeah. No, I'm just trying to understand the link between inclusive and secret. Can we just discuss the inclusive first before we go to secret? Or yeah, are the two points basically related? Yeah. So, so if I, uh, what you are saying is, like many people, when they think about bhakti, they think of some kind of sentiment where you claim that you have tears in your eyes or you get some dreams of Krishna. People have their own conceptions about bhakti as as some kind of sen naive sentimentality. But uh, when we say that, so it could seem that Prabhupada, when he's, when he's saying that bhakti is the essential message of the Gita, but then it is exclusive. But then if we look at what bhakti means, then there is also a very expansive or inclusive understanding of bhakti. And in that sense, if you say that it's Krishna's love coming out, Krishna's love song coming out, then bhakti includes karma, bhakti includes jnana, bhakti you can say yes. includes non-violence also. Nice. So when we are saying that we are excluding those Gita, other Gitas, mm -hmm. it's not in, in the, we are not saying that they are wrong. It's almost like we are saying that they are wrong in saying that this is the conclusion of the Gita. So so the the criticism is uh, we could say even the criticism is is for their non-inclusiveness. 
<laughs> so, right. Yeah. They're they're sort of projecting their exclusive understanding of what they think the Gita should be onto Prabhupada when he says as it is. Oh, and they are saying therefore yours is not as it is. How how dare you say yours is as it is? That's right. Something else. Okay. That's right. True. So you see, there's a bit of projection going on there. Yeah. Um, but it, and <clears throat> Prabhupada invites his readers to read the Gita with an open mind and to see what happens. Mm. You know, in other words, it's it's he's he's you know, if you're open to an experiment here, then start reading it and take the words of the Gita very seriously. See what happens. So it's beautiful. That's a, that's a very good example or a good, good approach. So if we take as an experiment, so if, we, if I say that as a reader, how am I to know whether your Bhagavad Gita is as it is or not? So, right. okay, you, Prabhupada is, in one sense, provoking, but it's not that Prabhupada is demanding faith. Because overall, right. his tone is, he's making reasoned arguments throughout the book. So, but he, and he's also, in one sense, giving right in the beginning uh, what he expects from the reader. So those are like, right. if you want to do this experiment, this is what you need to do. This is, these are the starting right. axioms, starting apparatus, starting requirements. Uh, so Prabhupada says that, at least in principle, one should accept Krishna as God and approach in a devotional mood. And this is not right. Prabhupada imposing. Prabhupada also says that this is what Krishna himself says. That Krishna does Arjuna, you are able to understand this message because you are a devotee. Bhakto si me sakha cheti, rahasyam So, so, so the open-mindedness is that it's like. This is the experiment or this is the pathway that, that so somebody is looking at it from the top, somebody is seeing from the bottom. Now from the bottom, what I am seeing cannot confirm what is being seen from the top. Yes, but that's right. Some, somebody is saying, okay, this is, what, this is what I am seeing. And if you go along this path, see if it makes sense for you. See if you come to this destination. So in that sense, it's, it's, uh, we could say it's a particular approach. But the particular approach is not presented dogmatically. It's like an mm, open-minded yes. presentation. It's, it's a call for open-mindedness towards a particular path. So if somebody says, yes. oh, I'm, I want to be open-minded, that means I want to question this path itself. Well, right. It's like, how can you do an experiment if you're going to question the, the basics of the experiment itself? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. How can you enter into an experiment if you're unwilling to do the experiment? I mean, it comes down as simple as, as, simple as that. Uh, you know, if, if you're just going to be fearful of the experiment, then, well, then the, no experiment will be conducted. Yeah. Um, so there's a metaphor given for this. That when uh, I think Galileo, he constructed the, the telescope. Uh -huh. And then he wanted to show how the moon the the uh, the moon is actually <clears throat> the earth is actually moving so his telescope would show that so there were some religious fanatics they said that they were refused to look in the telescope and they said no you are wrong so he, apparently he said that you look in the telescope and then you see he says no we are not going to look in the telescope but you are wrong so it's yeah. almost like that <laughs> it's a, you could yeah, see exactly. almost an unscientific approach mm, that yeah 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 Please. No, it's it, so. I mean, you're you're right to bring up the question of exclusivity, but then we also must appreciate the inclusivity that is in the teachings themselves. However, anyone approaches me, I reciprocate their love. I offer my love to them. Bajami, Bajam Yaham. I worship them. I mean, Bajami is a very strong word. Krishna says, ah, Bajami means I worship, I love them back. That's very inclusive. 
Mm. No matter how we approach Krishna, Krishna will reciprocate. I say that's darned inclusive. I would yeah. say that it's even supremely inclusive. That's amazing. And that's what is reflected in the next part of the verse. That all people are on my path. That's right. Om Vartmanu Vartante Manushaha Partha Sarvashaha. Yes. Mm. Yes. Bro, uh, just, I mean, since we are on this topic, some people translate that 411 second part as all paths lead to me. So, Manushaha Partha Sarvashaha, logically speaking, the, the path, the, the, the Sarvashaha is closer to Manushaha. It's not to Vartama. It's not, so, in that sense, mm-hmm. It's a, it's it's all pa- all people on my path is a much more logical translation, but does the Bhagavad Gita? How, what would you comment about this? Because you are recommending the Bhagavad Gita, you are going against the inclusive spirit. The Bhagavad Gita teaches all paths lead to that all paths lead to me. We, right. That is a more inclusive reading of the Gita. Not it that bhakti is the conclusion of the Gita. That's not an inclusive reading. How would we respond to that? You know. Um... I went back to my own translation of that verse, chapter 4, verse 11. And I found that there were some very subtle things going on in the Sanskrit. So I translated it. Okay. So in the way they offer themselves to me in just that way, I offer my love to them reciprocally. Okay, that's basically what we have in Prabhupada's translation. But then I went back and I retranslated the second part. To the turning of my own heart, do humans respond with the turnings of their own hearts in every way? Hmm. So that's quite, so that gets into, okay, so mama, okay, Mama Vartma, Vartma, okay? Uh, in a way, that's a turning. Vartma is a path. It comes from the, the Sanskrit word, uh, the, the uh, root, verb root, vrit, which means to turn. Hmm. And so, Vartma, Anuvartmante, right? Uh, I'm sorry, Anuvartante. So, hmm. to the turning of my own heart, Mama, my own heart, to the turning of my own heart, do humans respond with the turnings? They respond. They, anu vartante. They respond. The anu means they follow. Hmm. They, that, that, their own hearts follow my heart. What's going on in my heart? And so you see this. So to the turning of my own heart, do humans respond with the turnings of their own hearts in every way? That's beautiful. So this is, I mean, it's powerful. This is, this is, this means that Krishna is so close to us that his heart will, will reverberate with our hearts, even when we don't know it. There is such intimacy between divinity and humanity here. Now, one of the reasons, uh, Chaitanya Charanji. Sorry, sorry. Bro, if I, if yeah. I so, sure. So, so you are saying that all paths lead to me. Uh, there is a sense of that also in the translation. But yes. it's, over, if, uh, it's an oversimplification literally to say that all paths lead to me. But it's like to whatever extent the soul is turning to Krishna through whichever path, to that extent, that path is leading to Krishna. But it's, if the heart is not being turned, we can't literally say that all paths lead to him. Is that what you're trying to say? Or? Yes. That whether, you see, the problem with, with saying all paths lead to me, which is what I translated it as originally, yeah. is that, you know, some people think of a path, uh, say the Buddhist path. How does the Buddhist path lead to him? Hmm. You know, how does the Confucian path lead to him? Well, one could actually try to analyze that, that in some sense, any upliftment of the human spirit brings one closer to divinity. That's fine. 
But what I feel this is saying on a deeper level is that whatever humans pursue in their own hearts, Krishna's heart receives that. So in that sense, everyone is on the path of Krishna's heart. Whatever humans pursue in their heart, Krishna receives that. Yeah, because, because our hearts, you know, uh, we, we participate in the reality of the divinity's love. And all love comes from Vladini Shakti. We know this. So the, the point is that we are, uh, off, we are offering something. Uh, even when we're not offering it to Krishna yet, he feels that love. I mean, he's in the hearts of all living beings. I mean, do you think he's just sitting there, sitting there playing a, a video game? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> I mean, he's, he's not bored. He's not bored. He is he is looking for our love. He's looking for the love coming from sentient beings. He wants closeness. Love means closeness. Now, can you get any closer than the heart? So he is present within the heart. The Vrajagopikas, Maharaj Parikshit says, how can these gopis, married women, go dancing? with the Lord. And how can the Lord dance with married women? And the argument is, those husbands are not husband the way Krishna is their husband. He is so close to them, all, way closer to them than any mundane husband can be. True. Yeah, that, yeah. That, the that, word that, for that, husband, that. you know, one of the words for a husband is Bartra in Sanskrit, Bartra which means sustainer. There we go. There we go. Uh -huh. Bartha, right? Yeah. So, so the, the, the idea is that it is Krishna that is sustaining hmm. our ability to even love, but he doesn't control it. It's the one thing he doesn't control as Ishwar. It, it's simply, it is up to us. Because if he were to control it, then it wouldn't be love. Beautiful. So, so we could say in one sense, everybody, uh, whether you say everybody's on my path or all paths lead to me, if you understand it in terms that whatever anyone is pers pursuing in whichever path, it's, it's actually a part of Krishna. So even if somebody is loving someone else, they may not, they may not necessarily be Krishna conscious in that love. Or even right. if somebody is attracted to some mundane objects, somebody is attracted to some natural scenery. Krishna says that yad yad vibhuti mat samat sattvam, that everything attractive manifests a spark of my splendor. So in one sense, they are attracted to Krishna's beauty. They are attracted to Krishna's opulence only. So yes. if we consider, in our yoga podcast, you had the mention that divinity is embracing all of us. And we yoga is the means to return the embrace of divinity. So we could say at one level, uh, whatever we are attracted to, yes. it is a part of, it is, it is a manifestation of the divine. Now, to That's the right. extent we are become aware of that, to that extent, we will go closer to the divine. If you're not That's aware right. of that, we may not, uh, then it depends on whether that particular manifestation, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, we may go closer or away from Krishna. But yes. the point is that, so... So both translations can, uh, in one sense, uh, be understood in a way that both uh, harmonize with the principle of bhakti and recipro reciprocity. Yes. Mm. Yes. And here's the point, Chaitanya Charanji. You know, I've been teaching um, comparative religion, world religions for 30 year, 35 years um, in the university. Hmm. And, you know, people want to say, you know, some people come up to me and say, oh, Dr. Schweig, I've got it. Religions are all saying the same thing. I said, no, they're not all saying the same thing. That's what I'm teaching. I'm teaching how they're saying different things. But there's one level 
where they can meet. And that's the heart. That's where we find utter inclusivity and unity. But the ways we express it can be variegated, tremendously variegated. And that's okay. That's why Krishna says, however they want to express it. However they want to express it. That is up to them. Mm. But I will reciprocate and give them my love. So it's about this kind of the turning of Krishna's heart in relation to the turnings of our hearts. What he's trying to say there is that I feel what's going on with you. I'm not just sitting there like, you know, like as if I'm watching uh, something uh, totally. Um, look, the, the example is given in the Upanishads, right? The one bird oh, yeah. is what watching the other bird. Hmm, too. Okay. And the, uh, the the other bird is the is considered the the, uh, the 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 jivatman right, who's eating the fruit mm. of the tree. Well, the other bird is watching, but not just watching. The bird is hoping that the other bird will gaze back. Mm. The first bird is gazing lovingly in a, in a yearning fashion, the way Krishna calls out on his flute, the way Krishna dispenses his teachings in the Gita. Mm. He's calling us. And he's next to us. He's near us. Now, the bird is not watching from another tree. He's on the same branch. Mm. The branch is the heart. It's beautiful. In the, in the Abrahamic tradition, and in the Old Testament, there is the metaphor of the prodigal son. How yeah. the father is so loving, and the son comes back from squandering everything. Still, the father welcomes him back. But we could say from the Bhagavad Gita's perspective, it is, it is throughout the prodigal son's wandering, the father is with him, prompting him to come back. Yeah. So again, we can talk about the mountain metaphor. So yeah. when the father, when the son comes back, then he comes to know actually my father was waiting for me. He might be no, he might be yeah. worried. Is my father angry with me? Will my father reject me? But he may see the father's love only when he comes back and meets his father. But yes. in a sense, the father was with him all around, all the time and trying to like you said in the turning of the heart back to him. The father was waiting, hoping to, for that heart to turn back and. Uh, yes. So, yeah, that's a similar theme, a very similar theme. And, and really, it symbolizes the way God is with us. Yeah, beautiful. So, so, as Bhagavad Gita as it is, why would you want to change or modify the divine love song of Krishna, of Sri Krishna Bhagavan? That's like going into a great piece of literature, a great piece of music, and changing it. <laughs> Why would you do that? It's so beautiful the way it is. The way it is. It's beautiful the way it is. Bhagavad Gita, the way it is, as it is. Amazing. And it, as it is, ultimately. Mm. So, Prabhu, there's one, maybe one of Two, I don't want to take too much of it. One or two important questions with which maybe we can conclude. Yes. So at one level, we could say that we don't want to, uh, why do you want to change the Bhagavad Gita, beautiful as it is. At the same time, the Bhagavad Gita does contain a lot of wisdom, uh, which, is, uh, which is appreciable even for people who are not uh, necessarily in a devotional disposition. So we could say that if there are presentations of the Gita that uh, don't necessarily emphasize the devotional aspect, 
but they don't de- deny or downplay it. But that is also they are getting the heart to turn to some extent. So like yes. I, I have written a book on ten leadership sutras based on the Bhagavad Gita. So many times when I present that to devotees, they, they often object that Prabhupad said Gita is about bhakti. So is the Gita about leadership? So then I explain, yes, Krishna is a leader, Arjuna is a leader. It's a conversation between leaders, and they are talking leadership principles. But the point is that. somebody who is not interested in devotion does that mean that they will have no they should have no access to the gita or they will have no access to the gita till they are going to become devotionally minded so we can we can open doors so we can open doors as long as those doors uh, come to the devotional aspect that devotional yes. aspect may not be emphasized and certainly i'm not calling leadership sutras on the gita as bhagavad gita as it is i'm talking about leadership sutras Uh, that are drawn from the gita that are inspired by the gita yes so, so the problem comes when it's not when we take a, one aspect of the gita and present it for a particular audience the problem comes when we take that one aspect and say that that is the essential conclusion of the gita isn't it is that a correct understanding yes. beautiful beautiful yes i love the idea of of, of um bringing out um tools from the gita that that will infuse us with a sense of of uh of uh, satvik leadership uh i mean to me leadership is simply a ship on which a leader puts us that leads <laughs> to krishna's heart oh beautiful that's leadership okay it's a ship you know it's prabhupada's ship okay and we're being led okay prabhupada's the leader so there's a leadership Mm, so there, I'm a little simple, but that's that's my definition <laughs> that's of leadership. Simple, I would say that's simply deep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> huh? Okay. So, so the re- so, so the real problem is when uh, we could say that if somebody is. Uh, Taking a part of the Gita, when Prabhupada talks about Artha Kukutanya, half hand logic, mm-hmm. yeah, it is, it is. There's no problem to want the egg from the hen. The problem is cutting off the neck. Yeah. So it's a, if somebody wants to approach the Gita from a particular perspective, and they they feel inspired that way, and we know particular audience may be inspired in a particular way. In principle, there's nothing wrong in that. But the yeah. problem is when we we in fact we have discussed this was 1822, where we take knowledge in the mode of ignorance we take a part yeah. to be the whole that's right so so that is that is itself a, that that would be a problem so prabhupada's yes. bhagavad gita as it is is in one we could say a reproach of all other commentaries on the bhagavad gita or all other presentations of the gita which which take a part of it and make it the whole as that's prabhupada right. as it is in the sense he is presenting the whole to be the he's very clearly making it evident that this is the essence this is the heart right. this is the whole the of the whole gita. that by which the whole by which we can understand the different parts oh, that was the beautiful. in my analogy when you've gone to new york already then you can understand the different steps of the trip in a way that's different than if you never got have never been to new york amazing so the heart the whole and how to understand the parts in light of the whole very important but you see if if we don't have the whole grasped within our grasp then then we will use the gita in different ways but when the gita is embraced for itself as it is then we are liberated hmm that's amazing so what prabhupada is doing is he's giving us the whole and then he is in one sense we as you know we as readers of the gita and we as those who are trying to teach the gita to some extent we ha- it's our responsibility to see how the parts fit into the whole and explain that to others that's right uh, so but exactly. prabhupada is giving us the whole and we can strive to do that more and more and more exactly with each other and in our own swadhyaya that's right beautiful yes so so that's uh, i was thinking about that verse towards the gita when uh, when arjuna says that i accept fully what you say sarvam etat right. manye 
That's so, right. so that sarvam can, in one sense, it can mean all, but maybe a more precise way of thinking would be whole. The whole, Purnam, the whole. the whole, that's right. Sarva, that's right. Yeah, so that's I right. accept a whole, and then, okay, if this is the whole, and how do the parts fill in, fit in? So the Prabhupada parts were like, love. The part, each part was lovingly offered to me, just just as a parent lovingly offers this, that, the other. But the more important thing is not the the content of those things, but the way it is given out of love. Oh, okay. You know, in English there is a saying that uh, is when Sadhana Maharaj quotes in his book that the, the it is the thought that matters when you give your gift also. That's right. right. So, so we could say that what Prabhupada, if give me back to the metaphor of the top view, yeah. so what Prabhupada is seeing not just the particular words and the particular limb of path of path of spirituality that we give, but Prabhupada is seeing what is Krishna's thought behind it. That's and right. He's telling us that thought. That's so, it. That's beautiful, Prabhu. So, so now you will summarize. <laughs> yes, sir, I'll try. This is amazing. I'm so excited to attempt to summarize now. So we try to discuss today how to understand Prabhupada's presentation of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, is, it, uh, is it too biased towards bhakti? So he started by discussing that as it is, is provocative, it, it can seem presumptuous. Uh, but what Prabhupada is doing by that is that very bold claim, audacious claim, forces people to think, what is he doing? Then I mentioned that it is in terms of sadhana and sadhya. Prabhupada is uh, Prabhupada is stressing that, and what you said is that actually uh, yeah, at one at one level, it's Prabhupada is giving us the, the I think one consistent metaphor which came back to repeatedly is that that it is the Bhagavad Gita is coming from Krishna's heart, and that is what Prabhupada is consistently giving. So we could say we could take a horizontal journey from a place A to place B, and then we start seeing all the landmarks along the way in a different way when we get to the land, end of the landmark, end of our journey, or if we get to the top of a mountain. And then from there, we look down at all the parts of the mountain. Then we can see, okay, how all of these are constructed to take a person to the top of the mountain. So the, so the mystery novel is a mystery for the reader, but, but it's not a mystery for Prabhupada. Uh, it's not a mystery. So Prabhupada is coming from the top down and he is giving us that the top view of everything the, the view as seen from the top from that from the top means that the bhagavad gita is a heart to heart communication and that we see from the start of the gita the first chapter is important because it it depicts not just arjuna's outer conflict and not just some inner mental or intellectual conflict but an inner shattering of the heart so that setting is that scene is set in the first chapter and if you look at the end, Krishna's heart comes out when he is uh, he is call is is calling out. You know, have you heard with one point uh, with your on the with concentration on the one point? And then Sanjay speaks also that this is a confidential conversation. So the point which we're making is that Krishna is ultimately the whole Gita is Krishna's heart to address Arjuna's healing heart, and how it is Krishna's heart. We see it toward the end of the Gita as we come closer and closer to the end. But what Prabhupada, you, Prabhupada is, you are the fast pacing, or we are fast pacing. Prabhupada is giving us, showing everything in terms of the, uh, of the intent of Krishna in speaking it, of Krishna's heart of love. And Prabhupada is, and Prabhupada is not obscuring Krishna's word because Prabhupada is giving the Sanskrit also. So That's when you're right. translating Karma Yoga as Bhakti Yoga, yeah, as devotional service, so why would the author deauthenticate? Right? Put something in that book that is deauthenticating. So all these are in one sense like a wake-up call. They force yeah. us to think, right? From the title to some of his uh, translations, which may be, which may seem questionable. So he's not hiding anything. He's making, he's forcing us to think. And if we wake up, then we'll see the whole Bhagavad Gita from a different perspective. Mm. And if we don't wake up, then we may uh, we go to sleep. Then we will not. We will just dismiss the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's Gita as it. Uh, so then we talked, we talked about how um, if somebody is asking questions about the way Prabhupada translating, we have to, we can't dismiss those questions or disrespect those questions that, 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 uh, that, uh, by attacking that person as a doubter or a questioner. So you yes. talked about, you talked about your experience with the 
intellectual tools that academia provides us some high power tools and the pro one becomes a mundane scholar not just by using those tools but by getting so obsessed with the tools as to forget the purpose of the tools and that can happen in any field so if if we use those tools properly then actually even a deep study of the gita will show us how the gita is actually permeated with devotion how the whole of the gita is is in one sense krishna's krishna's heart calling out in love to us krishna's love song not the flute song but the love song here and then it is our reciprocation our bhakti is like it comes from the bhag so it means participating participating in the divine reality in the divine love and uh, so if instead instead of dismissing or disrespecting somebody who has questions we may need to uh, we may need to we say can i'll get back to you with the answers or i'll i'll connect you with somebody who can answer those questions so we shouldn't uh, because of our what is it we may import some of our own issues and then impose them on others so we need right. to avoid that otherwise we will do disservice to prabhupad prabhupad is waking people up and we may put them back to sleep again <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so then we talk, we talked about uh, how is bhagavad gita exclude prabhupad's bhagavad gita exclusive in calling as it is yes it does exclude those uh, explanations of the gita which focus only on the part and make it the whole but at the same time it is inclusive because if you understand Uh, that uh, ultimately creation is a reciprocation between god's heart and our heart everything that we do we, we don't do anything without engaging the heart the way it is engaged to the extent it is engaged in what it is engaged that will vary but we engage so it's if we consider from the heart to the heart as a reciprocation of bhakti then bhakti itself is inclusive bhakti includes karma bhakti includes gyana so it's like when krishna is teaching about ka- karma and gyana it's like a parent giving geometry instruments to a child the instruments are themselves one thing but they are given out of love by the parent so krishna is teaching karma yoga gyana yoga all these things but the, it's ultimately his love so we could say the circle of love coming from him and to the extent we start practicing bhakti that circle of love becomes completed yeah. and if we, if we don't still we are a part of the circle we may not realize it and then you give a translation of mam vartamanu vartante that to the the turning of the heart of to the turning of my heart the souls respond by turning their heart so right. so krishna gives us love and he in one thing he doesn't control is our heart but he wants us to turn towards him and so we if all paths lead to me if somebody it's not just literally every path literally leads to krishna but all paths we can say to the extent they comprise a the turning of the heart towards krishna to the extent whatever if a person is pursuing that is a that is a manifestation of krishna so in that sense it's true and yeah. uh, we discussed towards the end that so the bhagavad gita itself is is like it's it's so beautiful because it expresses krishna's heart so why would somebody want to change it but of course we can open more doors to it so it's yes. not wrong to take a p- parts of the gita and present it's only when we make the parts the whole if the right. parts can lead people to the whole then that is perfection and arjuna manifests that perfection when he says sarvam i accept i accept the whole so prabhupada's commentary gives us the whole and then it is our responsibility to ask us understand and explain to others how the various parts fit into the whole beautiful so any concluding words this is beautiful ru it's amazing excellent summary and a very rich discussion and uh, i always expect nothing less with you chaitanya charanji i i go to higher and higher levels of uh, union between intellectual gratification and spiritual satisfaction i can say <laughs> that's good excellent excellent <laughs> thank you very much i look forward so, to our podcast again in the future soon thank you so much chaitanya charanji all the best thank you jai jai